Okay, folks, can we get started, please? Hi, um, thanks for uh, all, all showing up today. I'm Herb Lynn from uh, CSAC, uh, and, um, and I, it is just my delight and pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Rebecca Slayton, who has been affiliated with CSAC for a very long and longer than I've been here. Um, so you were, you were here in 2013, 2012, or something like that, too. And you're long, officially a uh, professor at uh, Cornell in SCF, um, right now doing a, uh, uh, a fellowship at the Center for Advanced Behavioral Studies um, in an obscure place on the camp Stanford campus, um, uh, working on some things which she might tell us about today. <laughs> Pretty um, accurate. Um, uh, done a variety of interesting works, which has been seen in her bio, but you can, you know, she, she's here to talk, uh, give a talk on shadowing cybersecurity. Maybe she'll tell us how, we, how, how we, she came to, to that as a name for her, her topic. Uh, the usual uh, gig here, um, talk for about 30, 35, you know, 30, 35 minutes or so. Then we open it up for, for questions where the fellows get the first crack. Um, for those of you wearing masks, I can't tell if you're a fellow or not. Um, but you know, honor system, the fellows get the the first crack at at at, at, uh, at, at questions. Rebecca, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Herb, for a great kind introduction. I've actually been affiliated with CSEC even longer, but I won't do it myself by showing you here. Um, oh, but I'm sorry, did I miss you? Oh, okay. Fantastic. Testing. All right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. I see green. Okay. Green is good. Um, yeah. So I was just saying I've, I've been affiliated even longer than Herb mentioned, but I won't date myself by naming the year. Um, but it's wonderful to be back and to see many friends and colleagues here again. Um, and I want to start by describing a cyber attack in Ukraine that took place in 2015. This was years before Russia invaded physically. Um, and late in the afternoon on December 23rd of 2015, this cyber attack against Ukraine's electricity grid plunged hundreds of thousands of people into cold and darkness. So long before Russia started firing missiles at Ukraine's civilian infrastructure, it was showing what it could do through computer networks. Uh, this story uh, came out the next day, attributing the blackout to uh, hackers. Here I want to focus on, much more could be said about this, but I want to focus on the response to the attack by a transnational network of cybersecurity incident responders. So this list just shows a sequence of public reports about the attack. And a couple of things are interesting about this. First, the most early and visible reports came from private firms rather than government agencies. So you can see the US government is way down here. Um, and second, this transnational community of uh, private incident responders uh, extended into Russia itself. So here I'm highlighting Kaspersky, um, a Russian cybersecurity firm. Um, now US-based organizations treated Kaspersky's work as credible. They cited it in their own analyses of their attack. Kaspersky cited US and other Western aligned uh, reports in their analyses of uh, the attack. And taken together, this work makes a repeat attack more difficult. So it had a geopolitical impact. So this response to Ukraine is just one example of how transnational networks of experts, often led by private actors, not solely, um, but often have come to play a key role in providing cybersecurity for states, corporations, and citizens around the world. And states continue to play an important role in providing cybersecurity, but they also rely heavily on multinational firms. So global cybersecurity spending was about $150 billion in 2022. Growth rates are expected to continue exceeding 10% over the next the rest of this decade. Um, the leading firms in this industry are all multinational corporations. Um, and there are also many transnational conferences and competitions. These are just a few I'm listing here. You could probably find dozens easily. Um, and these competitions serve a number of functions. They're used for training, recruiting, they're showcasing skills, people show off what they can do. And they actually also are often used to find new vulnerabilities in technology. So I'm currently working on a book which tracks the historical rise of this new field of expertise. 
And by expertise, I don't just mean things that people know how to do, skills and knowledge, but also the ability to gain trust and credibility. So trust and credibility are major challenges in cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity experts offer no quantitative assurance of cybersecurity, unlike engineers who can tell you how many miles you should be able to put on your car or how long a computer chip should run. Software comes with no such warranties, certainly not with, related to, with relation to security. Um, and since it's impossible to prove that anything is secure, experts often prove their skills by breaking things. Um, so what I'm showing here um, at this, uh, in the, on the left or right here, sorry, left, right, um, is an image of hackers at DEF CON 2017 attempting to break into a touch, uh, touch screen voting machine. So I'm currently working on a book in progress um, entitled Shadowing Cybersecurity. Why do I come up with this title? I'm interested in how experts uh, or how workers really institutionalize um, practices of turning uncertain vulnerabilities and threats into apparently knowable risks. So the irony here is that there's persistent uncertainty, and that means that security is not something we ever achieve. It's always in the shadows. It's always behind more threats and more vulnerabilities. So security remains an aspiration, not an achievement. And that is the, the origin of the, the proposed title for this book in progress. So by studying expert practices, the book aims not just to better understand cybersecurity, but also a broader set of questions about the relationship between technological change, transnationalism, and vulnerability. And today I'm just going to focus on one question. Uh, and it's why do we have the strategic, specific technological and strategic vulnerabilities that we do? Why do we have some and not others? So for example, why was Ukraine's grid vulnerable to hacking over the internet? Why was the dominant response from private actors rather than governments? Is that itself a kind of vulnerability? And my argument, uh, which is way too complicated to make in 30 minutes, but I really want to hear what you all think, so I'm going to try anyway, um, really takes the form of two claims and two corollaries. So the first claim is that the specific powers and vulnerabilities of technology emerge not only from its use, but also from the expert practices of design, production, and maintenance. I'm going to focus a lot on maintenance. That's what cybersecurity incident response does, because that, get, that doesn't get a lot of attention. Second, these uh, claim, the, these practices entail trade-offs between technological affordances and vulnerabilities. So for example, when Ukraine's electrical distribution company decided to put some computers online, they likely gained some economic advantages, but they also uh, had new vulnerabilities. So the first corollary to this then is that choices about how to institutionalize these practices are also choices about what specific powers and vulnerabilities to create. And second, because expert practices create both power and vulnerability, these practices and decisions about how to institutionalize them are simultaneously technological and political, or what uh, STS scholar Gabrielle Hecht calls technopolitical. So let me unpack this a little bit. What do we mean by vulnerability? Vulnerability can refer to either a quality or a specific feature. So, uh, in international relations, we often hear about uh, strategic vulnerability, um, which I'm going to use to describe the degree of limitation on an actor's overall options, whether military, economic, or political. Um, the term strategic vulnerability is often associated with military or nuclear vulnerability. Um, I'm using it in a broader sense that draws on um, Robert Keohane's and Joe Nye's theorization of complex interdependence. They define vulnerability interdependence in terms of, quote, the relative availability and costliness of the various alternatives actors face. So that's a little bit different than what we talk about when we talk about technological vulnerabilities, which refer to specific features that enable accidental or intentional harm. So for example, in the field of cybersecurity, vulnerabilities most often refer to specific flaws in hardware or software, but they can also refer to poor practices like weak passwords or failure to update software. So a few observations about vulnerability. One is that it's very relational, um, both of these conceptions, whether it's a quality or a specific thing. Um, they describe not only susceptibility to harm, but also the kind, or thing, kind of thing or person that might cause harm. So strategic vulnerability arises from an actor's position in a heterogeneous network, um, which can include nations, non-state organizations, technologies, many more things. 
features of technology can be vulnerabilities in one context and strengths in another. So the openness of the internet, the openness of tra transportation infrastructures may be economically efficient and have a lot of um, advantages, but also come with security vulnerabilities. And vulnerability can either be understood as adversarial, one actor's vulnerability is another actor's opportunity, or shared, that everyone benefits from reduced vulnerability. There are also multiple interacting dimensions of any kind of vulnerability. So strategic vulnerability arguably has so many dimensions that it's almost impossible to measure or quantify. Um, it's a very, um, it's heuristically useful, but not really measurable. Um, <coughs> Excuse me, cold. I'm going to get my my next cough drop. Um, it's not COVID, but it is a cold. So um, the interactions between political limitations on an actor's uh, political, economic, military options in a complex set of networks and complex relationships is is obviously very, very complex. And um, there are really myriad different kinds of interactions. Um, different technological vulnerabilities also can interact. <coughs> in complex ways. So for example, uh, reliability and security can both are both strengths and the lack thereof are vulnerabilities, but they stand in tension with one another. So because subversion involves exploiting weaknesses in systems of rules, an extremely unreliable system might not actually be able to be reliably exploited. It may actually be more secure in some sense, but it has other kinds of weaknesses. So all technological vulnerabilities are not equivalent, they interact in complex ways. <coughs> so what's the relationship between technological vulnerabilities and strategic vulnerability or the limitations on actors' options? In international relations, most analyses focus on how technological vulnerabilities shape strategic vulnerabilities. So we have a large um, amount of debate in the field of cybersecurity about whether or how cyber cyber vulnerabilities translate into significant strategic vulnerability for states. Um, some argue that they enable adversaries to have significant strategic effects, whether in military operations, intelligence, attacking civilian infrastructure. Others argue that while the vulnerabilities are really there, they're actually not that easy to exploit in ways that have strategic, strategically significant effects. And you can think of similar debates in other areas of security. Do, does having an infrastructure that's vulnerable to terrorist attack actually constitute a significant strategic vulnerability um, that can be exploited by um, another actor in a significant way. So these analyses, of course, are, are very important, um, but they have largely sidelined questions about the origins of technological vulnerabilities. So this is part of a broader tendency, I would argue, to bracket questions about the design and development of technology from its political effects. The technological change is largely assumed to follow a kind of inevitable trajectory with vulnerabilities occurring as just an accident of development. And this assumption that vulnerabilities just sort of happen, technology just follows this natural trajectory, also shapes our arguments about how we should best mitigate technological vulnerabilities. So some argue, our, um, scholars argue that institutional form basically has to follow function when we're talking about mitigating vulnerabilities. Scholars of liberal internet governance argue that vulnerabilities in cyberspace are best managed by transnational act, uh, networks of private actors. So I'm quoting here from this 2013 paper, attempts by states to fundamentally alter the existing distribution of power and security provisioning networks are likely to lead to decreased performance. The extreme transnational interdependence in internet operations requires globalized institutions to be affected. So there's value again in this analysis, but it doesn't really explain how we define optimal performance. What do we mean when we say that um, any kind of state intervention is going to undermine performance? Um, and I would argue that conceptions of ideal performance are themselves uh, political. Um, so Western analysts tend to view optimal internet performance in terms of speed and accessibility in China and uh, other totalitarian governments. They tend to include state control of information as itself an important design feature. And that would actually be part of what they consider to be good performance. So what counts as a technological vulnerability or a strength is itself political. Um, but because uh, there's been a tendency to bracket questions about technological development from political analysis, 
we lack a coherent theory about the origins of technological vulnerabilities. So yeah, and this is just to uh, summarize the difference between conceptions of performance in the US and more totalitarian states. So if we consider, for example, um, uh, recent comments about the origins of cyber vulnerability, you see, and th this is a number of claims that come from this very thoughtful analysis by Richard Danzig. Um, one claim is that vulnerabilities are accidental, that early design choices paid little attention to security. Um, the problem with this is that it's not quite true. There's, some, there's something to this, and I'll go into it later, but um, there actually was a lot of attention to, to cybersecurity from the very, very beginning. Um, another claim is that vulnerabilities are inevitable. The complexity of digital technologies creates great capability, but this complexity spawns vulnerabilities and lowers the visibility of intrusions. So no matter what we did with respect to our initial design, we're going to have these vulnerabilities. And there's a lot of evidence, of course, to support this view as well, but it stands in tension with a third claim that vulnerabilities are reducible. Risk can be reduced or increased by human choices about how a technology is constructed, employed, and safeguarded, um, which also has a lot of truth to it. So there's a lot of wisdom in all these observations, but they raise more questions than they answer. If vulnerabilities are not entirely inevitable, if they can be reduced, why do we have one level of vulnerability and not another? And again, why do we have some vulnerabilities but not others? So to recap the argument I'm making um, very briefly, the specific powers and vulnerabilities of technology emerge not only from use, but also from expert practices of design, production, and maintenance. These practices entail trade-offs between technological affordances and vulnerabilities. Choices about how to institutionalize these practices are also choices about what specific powers and vulnerabilities to create. And expert practices and decisions about how to institutionalize them are simultaneously technological and political or technopolitical. So to illustrate this argument, I'm going to describe the origins and evolution of the field of cybersecurity incident response. And I'm going to draw here from some collaborative work I've been doing with Frank Smith, uh, someone I met here at CSAC many years ago. He's now at the Naval War College. So this map shows uh, cybersecurity incident response teams, um, CSERTs for short, also known as computer emergency response, response teams. These are uh, numbers of teams that are currently members of the Forum of Incident Response and security teams, or FIRST. And I'm just showing a few of the countries. Um, there's actually 668 member teams in 102 different countries. As of this week, um, it continues to grow. Um, there are more teams based in the United States than anywhere else, followed by Japan, and then uh, several European teams. Um, and it also includes teams from nations that are adversaries or rivals of the United States and other liberal democracies, such as Russia, China, and until recently, Iran. And there's a story behind why Iran is no longer a member of FIRST. So although this map associates teams with particular nations, it's worth emphasizing that the majority of firms or of teams in FIRST are actually firms or companies. Um, so, and, and they're multinational companies. So even though they might be based in the US, they're working all around the world. And even though they might be based in Russia, they have uh, customers all around the world. So today, Cybersecurity Incident Response is a transnational commercialized institution with most certs in the private sector. It actually started originally as a US national security initiative um, with most certs in the US national security establishment. And the story of how incident response transformed from a US national security initiative into a transnational and privatized institution is also a story about how scientists and policymakers around the world chose to accept some kinds of vulnerabilities, but not others. And I'll argue that the two kinds of strategic political considerations uh, shaped the technological institutions of cyberspace and incident response. First, uh, interest in minimizing uh, vulnerabilities that adversaries might exploit, so national security politics, but also interest in minimizing the shared vulnerabilities that might undermine a liberal political economy. Um, and this economic liberalism facet is the one I'm going to emphasize the most, but they're both really play a very strong role in shaping the way that this field evolves and the kinds of vulnerabilities that are developed. So the first uh, major internet attack to occur was on November 2nd, 1988. Um, it was uh, a worm engineered by a Cornell graduate student. Uh, Cornell is now my institutional home, so I love to mention that. Um, people at Cornell don't always love me to mention that. 
but the, the Morris worm caused the first major internet outage and the worm exploited technological vulnerabilities that were also design features. Uh, lack, a lack of security requirements for software applications. So for example, send mail. Um, users could develop and share any applications they wanted. There were no security requirements. Um, the worm also trusted, uh, exploited trusted host user relationships that were allowed to bypass passwords. Now the DARPA managers that, um, and, and so this was, uh, at this time the internet was basically an experimental network um, being run by the Defense, Advanced, uh, Defense Department Advanced Research Projects Agency or DARPA. And the DARPA managers who responded to the worm defended these design choices. They noted that in research systems, Security is often sacrificed in order to maximize functionality, performance, and flexibility. Imposing security requirements would sacrifice the interoperability and open interfaces that allow innovation and um, incremental improvement, improvement. And so instead of proposing mandatory security requirements, they recommended establishing what soon became the Computer Emergency Response Team Coordinating Center, CERT CC, to respond to the attacks that would be inevitable in a vulnerable system. So cybersecurity incident response very much started as a national security initiative. It was designed to serve, quote, the defense and national research communities and to serve as a prototype for similar operations in other computer communities. Most early teams were from the US National Security Establishment. I'm not going to read all of these, but you can see at a glance that this is basically military agencies, uh, national laboratories. And these are the 11 founding members of FIRST here. Um, early proposals for CERT CC and for incident response said nothing about international cooperation. I emphasize this because a lot of people point to incident response today and say, oh, look, this is this very collaborative institution. And there's some truth in that, but there are also some tensions from the very beginning. Um, some of these teams are working for military agencies that were already engaged in offensive cyber operations um, at this time. So even though the CERTs weren't doing offense, they were defending organizations that were. So uh, given these roots in the uh, US national security establishment, you might think that CERT CC uh, would be established in a US government agency in the Defense Department. Um, instead, it was established as a non-governmental organization at the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. And it was explicitly designed to be a community-based organization with no delegated authority. And it's worth noting here a road that was not taken. There was actually a recommendation to establish an interagency group to provide a quote, focal point for internet-wide policy direction and coordination in security-related areas. This was a general accounting office recommendation in response to the Morris worm. Um, this was not uh, what happened, um, in part because there was opposition to having more regulation. I'll say a bit about, more about that in a minute. Um, now, policymakers also chose to minimize product security regulations. This is internet security regulation. Um, market failures uh, encouraged a proliferation of vulnerable products. Others have written quite a lot about this, the economics of information security. And regulation might have helped reduce some of these market failures. So for example, there could have been liability for flawed products, better security standards, more mandatory security standards. Any of these proposals are controversial, but it's just worth noting again, that this is a road not taken. A National Research Council study conducted in response to the Morris worm, which Herb was involved in, um, noted the possibility of regulating product security, but it also noted that in the United States, regulation is a policy option of last resort and stopped short of recommending re regulation. So what I've been arguing so far is that US computer scientists and policymakers designed internet and incident response institutions to minimize security regulation. And these choices uh, created both strengths and vulnerabilities. So for example, a lack of any kind of required training for systems administrators or other users allowed the internet to grow rapidly, but it also meant that user practices were often weak. Uh, companies could very rapidly develop and market new internet products and services, but market failures meant the vulnerabilities proliferated. And these choices were consistent with a broader shift towards multi-stakeholder internet governance, standards that were developed not just by governments, but also by corporations, civil society organizations. So the notion of multi-stakeholder uh, governance is often summarized by engineer Dave Clark's 1992 declaration at the Internet Engineering Task Force meeting, 
uh, that we reject king president of voting and we believe in rough consensus and running code. And advocates of multi-stakeholder governance often argue that this technocratic approach to internet standard development is superior to something directed by governance or governments, but they usually neglect the warning that came with Clark's declaration, namely that security is the problem we love to ignore. And he asked, he, most of his talk was actually about security, not about internet governance per se. Um, and he ended by saying, how could we as a group decide what to do about security? So this question was really only partly answered by the development of more secure internet protocols. Those protocols remained voluntary, not mandatory. Many other aspects of security um, remained voluntary and unregulated. So despite the fact that this created kind of some kinds of vulnerabilities, US policymakers came to see the multi-stakeholder approach as a means of furthering US economic and political interests. Others have written much more about this. Um, that since the internet originated from the US Defense Department, this, this model really became the global approach to, um, to governing the internet. So multi-stakeholder governance is just one way in which choices made in the United States had a global impact on technological vulnerabilities. Other nations also participated in, in this kind of globalization. There was a global dif uh, diffusion of economic liberalism in the 1980s and 1990s which meant that nations lowered their barriers to trade, imported products from US technology giants, and societies around the world became dependent on common technological vulnerabilities. I'm not suggesting that other nations had more secure products, but there were common vulnerabilities that diffused around the world, which then amplified the potential scale of cyber attacks because they could just exploit one vulnerability and hit users all around the world. So throughout the 1990s, cybersecurity incident response then internationalized and commercialized in lockstep with these vulnerabilities. So um, I'm listing here uh, a number of teams just to give you some sense of how it spread geographically. It expanded from the United States and Western Europe to East Asia and former Soviet bloc nations. Many uh, began serving research and education networks but then became de facto national certs supporting civil society. Um, on the right here, you can see uh, the internationalization of uh, incident response in terms of first membership. And so if you compare it in 1996, you can see that it's still predominantly the United States um, and mostly Europe, other US allies. allies. Um, that changes by 2010, but the US is still the, the biggest single faction. Um, so many of these teams here were actually explicitly modeled after the US CERT CC. And you can even see the abbreviation is almost identical. CN CERT, this actually should be CN CERT CC as well. Um, but they did not all have the same conception of strategic vulnerability. And as a result, they effectively chose a different set of technological strengths and vulnerabilities. They institutionalized incident response on the internet differently. So China provides uh, a particularly illustrative example. So in the 1970s, China attempted to reduce its strategic vulnerability by growing an indigenous computing industry. This failed. So in the 1980s, China began encouraging partnerships with Western corporations. Um, and these proved to be an economic strength, but a security vulnerability. They succeeded in dramatically increasing both the production and use of computers, but they also made China subject to the same technological vulnerabilities that plagued the West. So it's significant that in 2001, China's CERT coordinating center, CN CERT CC, formalized, um, was formalized in response to Code Red, which was a worm that exploited Microsoft products, um, which affected China uh, quite severely. Um, so although this was modeled after the US um, CERT CC, China's conception of strategic vulnerability shaped its own institutionalization of both the internet and cybersecurity incident response. So others have written extensively about how China institutionalized its internet um, to allow for uh, government censorship, particularly through the so-called Great Firewall of China, although there were also a set of regulations and other things that were rolled out to um, make sure that only appropriate government deemed appropriate content could be um, spread through the internet. Um, but um, CNCERT CC then was actually part of the same organization that engineered the Great Firewall of China. Um, in fact, the uh, deputy chief engineer of CNCERT CC is, a is known as a father of the great uh, firewall, Feng uh, Bingxing. 
Um, and in recent years, evidence has emerged of collusion between CNCC and the Chinese Ministry of State Security to withhold vulnerability information while uh, the Ministry of State Security decides whether to exploit it. So in China, incident response practices sometimes enacted the politics of national security with attempts to exploit the vulnerabilities of others. At other times, it was more enabling the functioning of a liberal political economy and the reduction of shared vulnerabilities. And CNCC does, in fact, collaborate quite frequently with Western incident responders, including Microsoft um, and other Western companies, as well as uh, government um, incident responders. So some might argue that CNCERT's uh, cooperation with firms like Microsoft, as well as with incident response teams in other rival nations, such as Japan and South Korea, which happens, Hong Kong also happens, that this is evidence of technical experts sort of rising above politics. Um, I, and this is certainly how the technical experts themselves portray it. But I would argue that cooperative incident response institutions also enact a kind of politics, um, that of um, international, uh, political uh, international political economy, so economic liberalism. So consider, for example, why national and international organizations supported CSERT training in developing nations. Each APEC uh, economy's e-security is dependent on the e-security of the countries they do economies, they do business with. People will attack the weakest link. And members of APEC are economies, not countries. That's what they're called. Um, so CSERT cooperation is only one possible way to mitigate vulnerability. It's worth noting that nations could cut links in global commuter, computer communications networks or more, more closely manage those links as China has attempted to do. But ultimately the pro profitability of those global interconnections has been prioritized over security narrowly construed. Um, economic liberalism has also encouraged the commercialization of cybersecurity incident response. Um, and in fact, cybersecurity um, incident response commercialized faster than it internationalized. So this chart shows the commercialization of, of incident response. You can see that by May 1996, when it begins, um, commercial, the commercial um, sector is already larger than any other single sector of incident response. And this is striking because there were zero commercial firms involved in cybersecurity incident response at the beginning. Um, that list of 11 I showed you were all basically US military organizations. Um, so by 2002, private and incident, incident response teams actually constituted a majority of first members, but only 11 of 127 first members, um, which is to say less than 9% were based outside of North America or Europe. So um, decisions to, to minimize regulation of cybersecurity created ample space for the emergence of a private in, incident response industry. Um, so both economic liberalism, but also national security politics have shaped the institutionalization of cybersecurity incident response, as well as the cybersecurity industry more broadly. So it's worth noting that the US military basically trains the private sector. Former DOD incident responders then went on to establish private incident response firms and DOD work gives them both credibility um, and lucrative contracts. Governments rely on private incident responders as well as uh, government teams. And states restrict what, what firms can operate in what territory. So states still have a, a strong role to play here. And this shapes who uh, discovers intrusions. But there's an irony in the influence that uh, the national security state had on the emergence of this field. Private firms have incentives to publish analyses that sometimes undercut state-sponsored cyber operations, even those of their parent states. So one um, example is the Stuxnet malware, which the US, Israel, and other allied nations um, designed to attack Iran's nuclear enrichment facilities. So the US firm Symantec, um, along with other Western firms, played leading roles in analyzing and publicizing their analyses of this malware, even after engineers working on the project realized that it was likely a US engineered attack. Um, as one uh, semantic engineer Riley told his colleagues, if I turn up dead and I committed suicide on Monday, I just want to tell you guys I'm not suicidal. Um, so it had, had the sense that he was working on something big that his own government probably did not want him to be working on. Um, there's also the example I gave at the beginning of Kaspersky um, analyzing malware that was probably uh, sponsored in part by the Russian state in some way. Um, so in conclusion, I, I'm going to quote James A. Baker, a former head of the US 
Justice Department's Office of Intelligence Policy and Review. In 2013, he noted that, quote, we've tolerated the production, deployment, and operation of flawed devices and networks that process and transmit our most important information and operate our vital national system. And in this talk, I've been attempting to ask not only why we've tolerated these flaws, but also why we have some flaws and why not, and why not others. Um, and again, my uh, overly complicated argument um, is that the specific powers and vulnerabilities of technology emerge not only from use, but also from expert practices of design, production, and maintenance. These practices entail trade-offs between technological affordances and vulnerabilities. Choices about how to institutionalize these practices are also choices about what specific powers and vulnerabilities to create. Um, so for example, in the case of cybersecurity, US policymakers and computer scientists institutionalized a minimal regulatory approach to the design, production, and maintenance of computer networks. They sought to maximize openness and flexibility. And th this may have been an economic strength, but it was also a security vulnerability. Other nations, such as China, chose different strengths and vulnerabilities. And finally, expert practices and decisions about how to institutionalize them are simultaneously technological and political. So when CN CERT, um, CC, when China's incident response team withholds information about vulnerabilities to enable China's intelligence services to exploit them, it's engaging in a kind of competitive technopolitics. By the same token, when CN CERT CC helps Microsoft eliminate a botnet, it's helping maintain global interconne uh, interconnection and the liberal political economy that it supports. So while the detailed vulnerabilities of cyberspace, particular software flaws may be accidental, the expert institutions that enable those vulnerabilities, practices of producing software, for example, um, practices of maintaining software, were neither accidental nor inevitable. And in this sense, cyber cyberspace is vulnerable not by accident or inevitability, but by design. Thank you. I really look forward to your comments and questions. Okay, so the, the floor is open. Uh, anybody who's listening in, please put your questions in the uh, comments in the uh, uh, Q&A. Um, uh, and we open it up here. Uh, fellows first. Um, and I see you down here, Chu. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks Hi, so Julie. much uh, for your really fascinating talk. I'm Julie. I'm a pre-doc at CSAC and at HI. Um, I appreciated this historical understanding of cybersecurity practices. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the consensus of cybersecurity principles over the years and new principles that have come out as of late, um, especially as this organization has become more global and not just US focused. Thank you. So do you want to, are you asking about cybersecurity incident response in particular, or which is just a tiny part of the field or the field more broadly? You could talk about either the former or the latter. I'd be interested in both. Okay. Um, I'll say, I'll start a little bit with the more narrow, the, the narrower question of cybersecurity incident response. So one of the things that's interesting is this organization first, the Forum of Incident Response and Security Team which is basically a transnational organization. It is not an international, it's not managed by government, um, even though it started in the United States. They have a set of sort of best practices and they are able to establish norms and best practices in part because you have to be vetted to be a member of FIRST. And the idea is that by joining FIRST, you get certain kinds of advantages, you're in the club um, and, and you have more credibility, right? And this is part of how credibility is produced. Um, and so they're able to sort of institutionalize norms by having this gatekeeping function of allowing you in or not, depending on what kinds of norms you establish or whether you, sorry, whether you uphold best practices. What's interesting about the best practices is that they're defined at such a general level. I mean, even though there are these reports that China's cert is probably colluding with the intelligence services, they haven't been disbarred from first. The, there's really no discussion of that. The, the level of best practices is publish your policies uh, publicly about how you cooperate with other you know, governments, government agencies, publish your security handling practices. So basically give information um, to others about how you operate, um, but not very specific about uh, what would constitute ethical or unethical practices. Um, now, I'm. If you asked, I'm sure 
everybody in the you know organization would say no you probably shouldn't be helping other governments hack um, but you know this is not something that they are in the business of adjudicating um, so with respect to cybersecurity more broadly um, I you know it's always an evolving field there's dozens and dozens of certifications that try to sort of codify what counts as you know necessary technical knowledge the problem is that there's really no agreement that you know like this credential gets you in now you're definitely an expert um, and people will say well it really depends on what you can prove that you can do um, so i would actually argue that a lot of those certifications are really more just sort of the commodification of um, of credibility rather than professionalization in the sense of consensus agreement on these are the practices that we all agree you have to know um, and practice in order to do well. I don't know if Herb, you have been in this field longer than I have. Do you have thoughts on Julie's question? I was struck by the, the question of what counts as a principle. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, principles of secure computing has a specific technical meaning that was articulated, for example, in a paper in 1984 that is still widely cited, the Schroer Salzman mm -hmm, paper mm -hmm. um, about uh, you know, principles of least privilege and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think you're talking about principles at a very, very different level here. So I, I, I wasn't quite sure about, in, throughout this entire talk, entire talk, I'm sort of struck by the difference in what you mean by specific vulnerability and what I would mean by specific vulnerability. Mm. That's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, what you talked about as specific vulnerabilities, I think about as a large class of vulnerability mm -hmm. driven mm -hmm. by, by certain mm -hmm. economic mm -hmm. forces and so on. And there's also stupidity, which is also a, a driving <laughs> force. And, you know, that's the accidental part, <coughs> uh, you know, sloppy coding and, 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 and so on. You know, what's a buffer overflow? I mean, what right. is that? But organizations have some control over I mean, even if the individual make, may make bad practices, if you're part of an engineering team and those practices aren't checked in any way, that's partly the fault of the organization as well as the no, individual, but, right? Right, but, it's, but no organization would say, we don't want to check for them. They just, they just never get around it, to it, right? And which that, is a choice. It's, I mean, it would be costly, right? Well, agree. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, did did uh, we uh, answer uh, your question, Julie, about, because yeah, principles can mean so many different things, as Herb is pointing out. Down here, who, you, who are you? And, Hey, Ian Reynolds. I'm also a pre-doc fellow here at CSAC, hi. and hi. Um, so I, I love the project, and I love the direction you're taking with it, and I kind of want to kind of dive in a little bit to some of this tension we're talking about with principles itself. You know, you talk about these roads not taken, which I think is, like, fundamental to a project like this, um, and it seems like your roads not taken were typically coming from, like, the policy level. Mm -hmm. um, was there any internal contestation? You talk about these processes of knowledge production, what type of vulnerabilities matter, you know, places like DARPA, among these like early computing researchers who are like, no, this is what we need to do rather than what eventually emerged as what seems kind of like this technical consensus. So uh, thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, most of why I'm talking about the policy level is because I'm, I'm thinking about strategic choices, sort of how does a nation decide how to institutionalize certain things. Um, with respect to cybersecurity incident response, there were certainly computer scientists not just sort of advisory boards at this time. Of course, there are computer scientists on these advisory boards too, but who, who commented that the decentralized approach that um, was being taken by CERT CC, where basically they said, well, we're not going to serve all internet users. Um, so everybody else, you, you form your own incident response teams too. There were definitely computer scientists who said, Eugene Spafford being one of them, said this is going to lead to potential conflicts, competition. Um, this is not necessarily the best way to do it. There's going to be confusion about who you go to when there's a problem. So there was that within the, the technical community, there was some dispute about that as well. Um, I will also say that when it started to commercialize, there was um, in, in the late 1990s, which was right when the internet, you know, really was transitioning from a research network to something that people were using for commerce. Um, there was a task force within FIRST, the Forum of Incident Response and Security Team, that talked about their concerns about commercial incentives potentially disrupting cooperation. Um, and the irony there is that, I mean, there's definitely proprietary information. I'm not going to say that competition doesn't happen. It does. These are profit-seeking firms. 
Um, but they also have these incentives to publicize their reports. And so in some ways they share more than governments that are constantly worried about liability. I should say the US government. Um, and if you look at the early best practices published by the US-based CERT CC with some help from European um, teams as well, there are huge sections on liability and how CERTs have to watch out for their liability, which shows that very US-centric view of um, what constitutes a best practice. And they're much more worried about getting in trouble for sharing information than getting in trouble for not telling the government something. I mean, they, they mentioned that, you know, you may have legal hazard here, but they're much more worried about being sued by someone in the private sector for making them look bad than they are about not disclosing some piece of information. So the bias is all on withhold information, which then there is a, another technical contingent of sort of gray hat, white hat hackers who get explicitly very frustrated with CERT and say, we are reporting vulnerabilities to you that people are actively exploiting and you're not doing anything about them. And you know, CERT's so like, well, we don't want to get in trouble. We have to defer to the private sector. So they start forming these lists, like bug track is one of them, to disclose these vulnerabilities. Um, this ultimately puts pressure on Microsoft. Um, Microsoft is the biggest uh, target of their ire, although of course there are many other firms that they are also criticizing for not coming public about their information. And um, this is actually the origins of Microsoft's um, it's MSRC Security Response Center. They, they're not sure they want to call themselves incident responders because they're responding to vulnerabilities rather than incidents in their products. But anyway, the origins of that are basically to get ahead of the gray hat hackers who are putting this information out there. So there's, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but there's definitely a lot of contestation among the technical people about what counts, what constitutes ethical disclosure um, and incident response is at the center of that. And there's fascinating missions as well. They didn't want to call it this because of this. That right there is what killed this thing. Okay, thank you. Any other questions out here? Um, if not, let me turn to one from the uh, chat from Paul Meyer. What is your assessment of the effectiveness of FIRST and how it's perceived by governments? Uh, Russia, for example, vetoed accreditation for first representatives at the uh, UN open-ended working group on uh, IT security. Oy, yay. So this is a question I have not researched closely, and so I can't speak authoritatively to how governments perceive FIRST. What I can say is that there are rival organizations to FIRST, um, developed primarily by developing countries, um, that's a problematic term, but basically countries that have not been seen as being so aligned with the West and that maybe have not um, been, had the same kinds of resources. So impact is one, I'm um, trying to remember what that acronym starts for, but it's international multilateral partnership, something it's cyber something, security, right? Um, right. Um, and they try, and, and it's actually very much coming out of Malaysia. Um, so it was proposed by the Malaysian government and they sort of uh, established a big uh, cybersecurity incident response center, global cybersecurity incident response uh, center in Cyberjaya, um, Malaysia, which is basically sort of a tech hub that the government was trying to attract all kinds of industry talent to. Um, and almost all of the, the countries, so that is an international organization. They kind of got it in um, under United Nations, um, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, um, a, a set of guidelines around that. Um, and it's an international organization, so it's states being represented there, as opposed to first, where it's just any team can join. Um, however, it's not, uh, it's almost primarily entirely populated by countries that were not, the US is not a member. Um, a lot of Western firms are not members. I think Israel is a member, um, but it's mostly sort of these countries that um, they tend to be more totalitarian states um, and or, or poorer states, these are not the same obviously, um, that have joined this alliance. And so there's clearly a division and there's some kind of politics going on in terms of who is considered, what, what, what is considered a credible organization for information sharing, for example. 
<laughs> my impression of impact though, and US officials have basically said this, that US officials have said that they regard it as a publicity stunt. And it's really hard to see what they're actually doing. <coughs> no. Thank you. I'm Joe Nye visiting at Hoover. Oh, nice hi. to see you. Um, I found this fascinating. I really liked it very much. But I wanted to get you to sort of um, project forward. I know it's not in today's talk, but the implications. What you show <coughs> American liberalism shaped the type and number of vulnerabilities that we have. And I thought that was nicely done. I mean, Dave Clark and multi stakeholderism and so forth. But if one looks at what's been happening in recent years, what you find is that you have the emphasis by Russia and China on sovereign control, not multi stakeholders. In fact, mm -hmm. they attack mm -hmm. multi stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also have the question of whether this sovereign control, which the Russians and Chinese are exerting, will lead to a different number and types of vulnerabilities. And if so, will you find different vulnerabilities in, let's call it the Western part of the internet or the open part of the mm, internet, mm -hmm. as opposed to the Russian and Chinese internets, which, which sometimes is called the fragmentation of the internet. So I, I, I know they all are officially cooperating at first, Mm. It's not the same thing mm. as what they actually do. Mm -hmm. And given these trends in Russia and China, uh, do you expect to see a different number and different types of vulnerabilities in, call it their internet, compared to the, call it our internet? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, but describe them. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, yeah, that's a the easy answer. Yes, we would expect that. Um, I think the challenge that I'm having here is is exactly what Herb mentioned: is trying to actually disaggregate what we mean by vulnerability, right? I mean, so I'm kind of talking about institutional vulnerability, which then produces these technological vulnerabilities when you don't have, you know, requirements that companies um, when there's basically no liability for or at least to produce software um, or no requirements that companies maintain it, then that produces sort of these very fine grained, you know, this particular bug vulnerability, right? And I'm, I don't think the project I uh, have in mind can possibly get into that level of detail. Um, and so I'm sort of staying more at the level, the institutional level, thinking about institutional vulnerabilities. Um, but I think, that is a great question that I need to explore actually at the institutional level. So what about the institutions in China, in Russia, um, are really constitute different vulnerabilities than those of the West? Um, and I have to do more research there. But I mean, I, could, I can hypothesize what you would expect, right? I mean, you, would, you might expect that um, companies that uh, have, you know, if they're not given any kind of incentive for, if, or if they have incentives to collude with the government, that that's going to have other kinds of unintended consequences for Does security. Today, mm. That's a very good question. And I'm always a little bit wary of citing that example because you, this attack potentially played kind of a deterrent role too. So was Kaspersky maybe aligned with the government in a sense, right? Um, to what extent did that undermine? I think the work that Symantec did definitely undermined the US operation. Um, although you could say that, you know, the US wanted the world to know that it was behind it, sort of. <laughs> but they didn't want the, the, the attack to be diffused. But it's very hard to know um, exactly what's going on there, why the Russian government would tolerate that. I, you kind of wonder what, what would happen if the Russian government cracked down on Kaspersky, um, whether they could get away with it or whether it would just, because Kaspersky, Kaspersky is a multinational firm, whether it would destroy the firm and actually have some blowback for the Russian government. 
Um, there's another example I was just going to come up with. Especially soft, security software is known to send back stuff to, to, the, to the Russians. But to some extent, all I mean, don't all um, antivirus software uh, packages have to do that. I mean, they all do telemetry where they gather information from their customers. Let me, let, let, let me be more specific. Yeah. Because first, the security software scans your disk for a word, the, the word pops, the phrase top secret, and emails those files. And I haven't been able to find the report validating that. I think you I'll mentioned that to me. I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. Okay, because okay, I asked you for the report and I thought you said that it wasn't really but let's, verified. Let's, but this is, let's it's talk. certainly rumored. It's certainly rumored, yeah. Well, but the point is that I could write such a program. And that if I could write it, they can surely write it. Oh, sure, they could. But, I mean, that has a huge, huge implications for their global customer base, right? If they- Why? Well, because now we, they can't get US, you know, because first they have them blacklisted from receiving any kind of government, US government subsidies. That's right, and, and that's what's happened. Right, they're not, they're not, they're, you can't, you, if you're a US government, you can't use Kaspersky software. Yeah. And it's been worth it for them. It, it, it's worth it's been it. Worth, in other words, they, they for, for some period of time, they sent back stuff. Yeah, but, but eventually it, it cost them. Yes, uh, 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 well, it cost them monetarily, but it's not clear that it, you know, they, they, they got X years of secrets. Yeah. Well, the government did. Yeah, right. Yeah. Anyway, so. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's it's still somewhat controversial, isn't let's it? Let's talk. Yeah. But I wanted to okay. answer Joe's question. Okay. An example, a very good example of, of what you're talking about with a more authoritarian government is that you can, you can imagine greater pressures on a, on a firm for lawful access to, to, to data. Okay. And to the extent that they build products with, Government with built-in guaranteed government access, um, it's not clear that somebody else is going to buy them. So that that that's an example of a vulnerability. I mean, it's it's a vulnerability from my standpoint as a person who in the U.S. might want to use Chinese software that otherwise would be very good, but I won't do it because I know the Chinese can get into it. That's just an example. There was another one, but I hope we can keep talking. Yeah. Any other questions here or, 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 or thoughts? Let me read. Uh, um, I see, I see oh, hands. Is there not local? Oh, Rihanna. Hey, Hi. thanks so much, Rebecca. I'm Rihanna Nielsen. I'm the cybersecurity fellow here at CSAC uh, as a postdoc. I'm really struck by the notion of talking about cyber vulnerabilities. And you started the presentation with the example of Ukraine in 2015, which was targeted against critical infrastructure. So the kind of the question, it's a bit of a two pronged. The first that stood out to me is whose cyber vulnerabilities are we talking about specifically? If we're mm -hmm. talking in the West, obviously so mm -hmm. much of critical mm -hmm. infrastructure is overwhelmingly privatized. So it's owned and operated by private organizations that then have incentives to maximize profits. This is something you touched on a little bit in the Q and A. So I was just wondering to what extent this tension and these trade-offs that you're talking about, how does profit play into that? when we're talking about guaranteeing cyberspace against potential threats, how does essentially private organizations wanting to maximize profit play into that? So the question is how do, does the profit incentive tend to increase or decrease vulnerabilities? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like so for instance, if private corporations are obviously geared toward maximizing profit, they may choose to spend more or less in guaranteeing their cybersecurity systems prior to a particular breach. I know you're mm -hmm, talking a lot mm -hmm, about response, mm -hmm. like kind of after a breach has already happened, mm -hmm, but they mm -hmm. may not invest as much right. money in identifying vulnerabilities or ensuring their cybersecurity systems because they think they can just kind of get away with it unless right. something happens after the fact. Right, right, right. Yeah, so there's a huge amount of debate about um, the whole field of cybersecurity risk management, like how much is enough. And um, one of the challenges for any um, CISO, Chief Information Security Office, Officer, is to prove that there's some kind of return on investment in security, right? Because it's, it sort of just represents a loss. And there've been lots of studies trying to make the argument that somehow there's a return on investment when you invest in security, as opposed to just well, you could either lose this much or lose that much, right? How do you, how do you think about it? Um, and debate about whether it's rational or not rational, the choices that they make. Um, and the question of whether 
um, the profit incentive, I, I mean, I think it sort of depends on the time frame that you're thinking, whether the profit motive tends to um, increase or decrease vulnerability, right? You could argue that, and this is why I think, you know, the argument that, well, we don't want to regulate this stuff because it's going to, you know, reduce innovation. I think it's an open question, you know, it's a question of what, what regulations, you know, does it lead to, is it leads to more secure systems, does it actually lead to greater profitability long term, um, or is it just a loss? And to be honest, I don't know how to answer that question. I've been wrestling with it. Um, so I'm glad you've asked it. And I feel like I need to sit down with 10 economists and have them try to get me straight on this. Um, but I suspect I'd probably get 10 different answers. Um, Okay, I, we've come to the, the end of our time here. There are several questions in the chat, um, which I will send to Rebecca privately okay. um, and, and, and look up your emails um, uh, for it. Um, two of you are internal TSAC, one is external, but I, Eric Gross, I have your email. Uh, so I will send them to Rebecca. Um, and thank you. Let's join me in thanking our-, our Thank you. Our, 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 thank you.